So today is the 27th, 1, 27, 17, and we're talking about biotic and abiotic factors. And the prefix bio means life, while the prefix a means without. That's what we just talked about. So the biotic factors in an ecosystem are the living things that influence other things in the system. What biotic factor caused the drop in oxygen levels in Biosphere 2? Bacteria. Bacteria are a living thing. They are a biotic factor. If we think back to some of the stuff we did early in the year, um, what biotic factor was causing, oh, what was it, newborn deaths in hospitals in India? It was a bacteria. It was a resistant bacteria. That's a biotic factor. It's a living thing that influences some other part of the system. Um, if you have a great digestive system and everything is always smooth and consistent and regular for you, you can thank the biotic factors living in your gut, the bacteria living in your gut. <laughs> so biotic factors are living things that influence the rest of the system. If you, ooh, man, we're trimming this, so I'm probably going to do the parasite um, video as a flipped assignment that you'll have to do on your own. But can you be influenced by another living thing? Of course you can. And, and some of the basic ways in which living things influence other living things, and I can expand this for you for the moment, um, are things like predator-prey relationships. Um, Predator organisms eat prey organisms. We don't spend a whole lot of time on this because by the time you're a sophomore in high school, you darn well better be able to identify who's the predator and who's the prey. Coyote and rabbit. Who's the predator? Coyotes. Um, that would be one heck of a bunny that could turn that around. So, rabbit and clover. Who's the predator? Rabbit, vicious predators on leafy greens in the yard. Um, Predator-prey relationships, as I said, we are not going to spend a lot of time on. Um, I think that by now you can do those in your sleep. Do predators influence their prey? Oh, yeah. Um, I could use a coyote in my neighborhood right now. I think I've mentioned that we have a rabbit problem. We have had a boom in rabbits in the last few years. I need a predator to reduce the size of the rabbit population. I need a predator to put a check on these rabbits that keep eating all my plants when I set them out. What if a disease kills off all the prey in an area? What happens to the predators? They die. They move. Your food source dries up. You're, you're toast unless you can do something different. So predator-prey relationships we won't spend a whole lot of time on because um, I think you have them. Symbiotic relationships, on the other hand, um, we'll spend a little bit of time on, not so much in this chapter. Um, we'll do more about these in the next chapter. But they're long-term relationships. These are multi-generational and they're between two members of different species. There are three basic categories of symbiotic relationships. Ones where everybody benefits, everybody gets something out of it. One, ones where one organism benefits and the other isn't really hurt. And one where one organism benefits and the other one is actually actively harmed. Though notice it says harmed, generally not killed. Or at least not killed outright. Not killed outright. We'll, we'll talk a lot more about those, like I said, in the next unit. But these are how living things can affect other living things. Um, has any, okay, who here has ever caught turtles? Okay. I remember my, one of my earliest experiences with leeches. You ever seen leeches on turtles? 
they get them down in their armpits very often. You pick up a turtle and if it does any of this, you can see little leeches around where um, their limbs go into the shell. Um, it's a nice accessible location. Is the leech a living thing? Yes. Is it getting something out of the relationship between it and the turtle? Yeah, it's getting blood. It's getting a blood meal. Is the turtle benefiting in any way? No. Is the turtle being killed? No. Is the turtle being harmed? Yes. Now, could a turtle be killed by leeches? Yeah. You get sufficient levels of infestation, you can have a parasite that removes enough blood from their host that that host is weakened to the point where they either die of the blood loss or they die just because they're so weak that they can't resist any other challenges that they end up with. Um, are those parasites affecting the population of turtles in that pond? Yeah, they are. Abiotic factors and their influence. So this is the non-living things in an ecosystem that have some form of influence on the living things in the ecosystem, on the community, on the populations. And this is what we're going to talk more about here. We're going to talk a little bit about tolerance and what you can tolerate and what I can tolerate. So temperature is an example of an abiotic factor, how hot it is. Um, when it got crazy hot in here a few weeks ago and it was hot over the weekend, um, a lot of my plants died. I had some plants from my botany class that died because it was just too hot, too dry. Those are abiotic conditions. It was the little starts that were on that high desk. Um, we had some very young little kale plants and little young lettuce plants and they were cooked just done. Oh well. Those are abiotic conditions. Those affect the populations that live in an ecosystem. Oops, we're paused. Okay, so we have things that live at these very, in these very hot environments. We have things that live in very cold environments. Nothing that can do both. So what are deep sea vents? Um, let me draw it. There's the earth. Um, it's not a great earth, but it'll do. So here, here are some continents, here are some oceans. Um, so you, you remember the layers of the earth. What are they? Core, mantle, crust. Well, geologically, we actually tend to think more about lithosphere and asthenosphere. Um, are these terms you've ever heard before? Okay, so lithosphere is the rocky part. Asthenosphere is the part under it that's like hot peanut butter. Um, it's kind of melty and gooey. And where those plates here are moving apart, you have magma coming up and then cooling because those plates are moving apart, and you have what are called deep sea vents, and you have superheated water down at the bottom of the ocean where you have crustal motion, and so, I mean, the water there is literally like 750 degrees Fahrenheit. Why isn't it boiling? Huh? Pressure. Pressure. So um, at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, up here in the atmosphere, water molecules escape from the liquid phase and they go into vapor. If you put it under pressure, you can push them back down into the liquid. That's what pressure cookers do. At the bottom of the ocean, the pressure is so tremendous that even at 750 degrees above Fahrenheit, above zero Fahrenheit, they don't boil. It is insanely hot. I mean, seriously, you couldn't get within quite a ways of it. You'd be cooked. You'd die. But there are bacteria that live there. There are bacteria that live there. Um, there is not an organism alive that can take that whole range of temperatures. Every living thing has some temperature range in which it thrives, in which it survives, and at which point it just plain old dies. Um, for humans, your core temperature, so that's the temperature of your guts, basically, um, has to be between 113 and 86, or you die. You cease to survive. Um, 
Hypothermia is when your core temp drops below 86. This can happen on a 40 degree day under the right conditions. Um, being wet, being in wet clothing on a 40 degree day can be life threatening. Your core temp can drop. It's a, it's a big issue with hikers, um, like long haul hikers and backpackers. Um, a 40, degree, a 40 degree wet, windy day is often more dangerous than a 25 degree dry still day. Because at 40 degrees, it's cold enough, and if you're wet, as that water is evaporating off you, it's pulling heat out of you consistently. It's a very dangerous situation. Um, you're, you've, who here has ever had a fever? All of you. I can't even assign homework on that. Um, when you have a fever, your core temp rises, your body temperature rises. That's what a fever is. And it's your immune system trying to kill bacteria. But if you have a core temp over about 113, you die. Your organs start to shut down. You go into organ failure. Now, what's, what's average human temp? 98.6 98. is what we call average human temp. Some people have a slightly lower normal temp, resting temp. Some people have a slightly higher resting temp. On average, we're all hovering around 98.5 for an average resting temperature. You can, who here has been cold? <laughs> Worked out in the cold on a, on a wet day, felt your hands start to lose coordination. Oh, my hands are so cold, I can't, I can't hold a pen, you know. Or, um, you know, I'm, I'm so cold, I can't quite think straight. I just, I just need to get warm, that's what I need. You know, it becomes an overriding concern. It's because you have a temperature range in which you thrive. Who here has been overheated? Anybody prone to heat exhaustion? I am. I get massive headaches from heat and dehydration. Like, as a kid, we didn't carry water bottles around the way you do. I don't know how any of us lived. Like, we didn't hydrate. We didn't believe in it or something. I don't know. I never had a, nobody had a water bottle. Just suck it up, kid. Um, and I would have horrible, crippling headaches in the summer. Like, running around outside on a really hot August day, and by the end of the day, I was miserable. If I had just known to drink water, <laughs> life could have been so different. But um, your, body your body core temperature rises, and you get kind of dumb, and you don't function well. And above a certain temperature, um, perceptions start to shift. Have you ever had fever dreams? If you have a high enough fever and, like, things... I remember as a kid, like objects seeming to grow and shrink. That's your brain being messed up by heat. Ugh. There's a range in which you're comfortable. That's the same for any organism on the planet. You, bacteria, maple trees, dandelions, blue whales, earthworms, ladybugs, doesn't matter. Moss. There's a temperature range at which everything is cool, everything is wonderful, you can thrive, and there's a temperature range where it's okay, you're hanging on, you're surviving, you can make it, but life's a little harder. And then there's a temperature range at which you just die. <laughs> We're going to explore those ranges. We'll get rid of our, our earthy, crustily thing. Did that help with the um, vents? Okay, cool. So, precipitation. This is a bigger one for plants. But there's hydration, there are hydration issues for humans, too. There are plants that live in places where they go literally years without a drop of moisture. And then there are plants that live in tropical rainforests. There are plants that live submerged in water. But there's nothing on the planet that can stand that whole range of moisture. Soil is an abiotic factor. Every plant in this room is growing in soil. And they have very specific soil requirements. So there are plants and bacteria that can live in super acidic soils. Does anybody here have a blueberry bush at home? Blueberries, pine trees? Pine trees, okay. Um, azaleas or rhododendrons? Big pretty bushes? Okay. Those are all things that like acid soils. You know about pH, right? You know, what do you know about pH? What is it? It has something to do with acid. 
It's how acid or how not acid, how alkaline something is, how base. Um, you probably do a little bit with it in physical science. And it's a scale from 0 to 14. 7 is neutral. Um, water, plain pure water is a 7. Lemon juice is acid. Those are the low numbers. So think about dropping lemons on the floor. Low pH means acid. Um, low acid, you get really low on there, like battery acid, that can hurt you. Um, you go above 7, you're looking at basic. Clorox is basic. Bleach is basic. Baking soda is basic. Um, really basic can also hurt you. Clorox can hurt. Don't drink Clorox. You know that already. You're smart critters. Um, so there are organisms that live in acid soils. There are organisms that can live in acid water. There are also organisms that can live in alkaline soils. But there's nothing that can live in that big wide range, or very few things. Most things have a range in which they are comfortable and happy and able to survive and thrive. Tolerance. What does it mean to tolerate something? In the, in the movie that we started the year with, Nightmare Bacteria, they talked about how well a patient could tolerate an antibiotic. I have had antibiotics that I could not tolerate. I took an antibiotic once that made me violently ill within about eight hours of taking the first dose. It's the only antibiotic I've ever had to quit. I had to call my doctor and say, I can't take this one. Get me another one. Um, I could not tolerate that antibiotic. It just made me horribly sick. Um, we can look for anything, any abiotic condition at how well you or a tree or anything else can tolerate it. So this is called a tolerance, you can call it a tolerance graph, whatever. Hey, what's that distribution? <laughs> Looks a lot like a normal distribution. Um, it's a little bit different. So here we're talking about, you know, for a species, and we're talking about where they're comfortable. So the image that I'm going to draw for you is kind of a red light, green light, yellow light. And this could be, um, we could be looking at fish. Um, we have a lot of people who fish in here, yes? Okay. So we could be looking at something like tilapia. Oh, has anybody, okay, let's talk about tilapia. Because I like to eat. I enjoy eating a lot. Um, tilapia are a tropical fish. You know this? Okay, you can go to the grocery store and buy tilapia. Um, they're also probably a great money maker if you wanted to set up a little aquaculture thing. There was a guy somewhere in Youngstown who was trying to set up sort of an indoor tilapia farm. So they are a tropical fish. And, of course, they're from a lot further south than here. If you put tilapia in the pond out there, do you know what would happen to them come winter? They would all die. They would go belly up. They need warm water year-round. So if we're talking about tilapia and we're talking about water temperature, I don't know exactly what their ranges are, but it would be pretty warm. Um, you know, maybe this is like 70 to 80 degree water. And this might be their zone where they thrive. So if something is thriving, what does that mean? What does it mean if you're thriving? What does it mean? You're doing, you're awesome. Life is fantastic. When you're thriving, um, you are able to grow. You're able to reproduce. Everything is good. Woohoo! Thriving is fantastic. 
That's why it's a green light. So it's, you've got everything you need. So for tilapia with water temperature, we're in the, we're, when they are in this optimal range for water temperature, individual fish are growing. I mean, this is assuming everything else is good. They're getting enough calories. They've got everything else they need. Um, they're having baby fish. They're having little baby tilapia. Um, they're reproducing. Their population could grow, assuming nothing else gets in their way. They could actually build a population. Well, outside that range of thrive, and we'll make this orange, we have, or no, I'm sorry, yellow. We'll go yellow first. So there's our yellow zone. Guess what the yellow zone is? Life's just a little bit harder. It's a little bit tougher. So this, you know, maybe this is 60 to 69, 81 to 90. I don't know what these are. These, I mean, these numbers are kind of imaginary. But in this yellow zone, They can still grow, individual fish can still grow, but do you remember what has to be, like everything has to be great in order for you to do what? Reproduce. So outside that thrive zone, we hit a point where you still survive, you can still grow maybe, but there's no reproduction. No babies. Reproduction starts to shut down when life is not quite so easy. So individual fish do fine, but there are no bibbies. Ah. Anyway. Grow, no repro. No reproduction. They can grow, but they can't reproduce. So then outside this zone, this is where we get into the orange. And this orange, this is where you're struggling, really, really struggling. And I don't, you know, I don't know what the numbers would be for tilapia. Maybe it's, you know, water that's between 91 and 100. Remember, these numbers are kind of all made up. And 50 to 59. So in this orange, no grow, no repro. No grow, no repro. Let's see if I can copy that. Well, you know what's coming next, right? What do you think the red zone is? This is death. Yeah, the red zone is death. <laughs> For some species, this range is wider than others. Some species are really finicky, really picky, really hard to keep alive. Um, does anybody, anybody here have a saltwater tank at home? Have you ever seen a saltwater fish tank? Okay. They're tough. They're really tricky. And tropical fish tanks. Um, my husband had a fish tank like that for a little while, and then we came home and everything was dead which apparently is pretty common in those kind of tanks. <sighs> he hasn't started it back up. It's just an algae tank right now. It's kind of gross. I, I try not to look at it. <laughs> but um, 
some species get to that zone of death pretty fast. Some species have a really narrow band where they can survive. Let's talk about this in your health. Who here eats hamburgers? Who here eats food of any sort? I may have vegetarians. I don't know. Um, if you eat any kind of food, you know that there, there can be bacteria on food. Who has heard of a public health recall for salmonella, E. coli, listeria, you name it? Love getting in the bacteria. So we'll, we'll think about hamburger because it's an easy one. If we think about, and I'm going to borrow this, copy it, take it to here. Grow, reproduce. Let's say that this is for E. coli bacteria. Now, does the temperature range at which they die matter to you? Oh yeah, I would like to cook my hamburger to a point where it will kill any E. coli bacteria that's in it. Because I don't really want to get E. coli. So, anybody here taking, who's, who's in Foods and Nutrition? Who's had Mrs. Agnew? Okay. Um, when you're cooling food, are you supposed to cool food down and keep it in the fridge? Yes. You want to cool food down and keep it in the fridge because if there are bacteria in it and you keep them in their green zone, individual bacteria can grow and individual bacteria can reproduce and you can get lots of bacteria in a few hours. If you put them in this zone by putting them in the fridge or this zone by putting them in the fridge, there might be a few bacteria in the food, but they're not going to reproduce. They're not going to multiply. You're not going to have bacterial growth in your food. If you can put them in this zone by cooking them, if you can kill them, death to them, then now you don't have those bacteria in your food. So that's an abiotic factor that controls the population size of a species. We can talk about would, would the E. coli bacteria in this pound of hamburger be a population? Yes. Yes, it would. Never going to eat hamburger again. Actually, there, there have been a number of um, foodborne illness scares lately in the last few years with like bagged lettuce pre-washed. What's, what's the horrible part about that? What don't you do to bagged lettuce? cook it. I wash mine. I don't care if it says pre-washed. I still wash it. But if E. coli bacteria have penetrated um, any part of the leaf, which they can under certain circumstances, you don't wash or you don't cook your salad. And that's why actually it's, you know, bacterial contamination on something like salad greens is actually a little bit more dangerous than bacterial contamination in hamburger. You cook your hamburger you have a chance to kill those bacteria so they don't make you sick. You don't cook your, you know, mixed baby greens. I mean, they're disgusting if you do. You don't want to do that. <laughs> it's really gross. But this kind of tolerance curve has an impact on you. Now, does this hold true for humans? Yes. And we work really, really, really hard to make sure we stay in our green zone. Name me one thing that you are doing, not like outside your body, right now today to stay in your green zone. How are you doing that? Where? What? Okay, I, I, I couldn't. Did somebody say wearing clothes? Because that's a start. I'm, see, I'm not kidding. Naked in the winter is death. Is it not? You wouldn't want to be outside naked today. It would be a very bad idea. So clothes is the first step. You don't have a nice furry coat. You are, your pelt is reduced to this ridiculousness on the top of your head. That's not keeping you all that warm. Though I hear from boys, especially, who have shaved their heads, that you'd be amazed how much warmer you are. You've had a buzz cut at some point in your life. 
Yeah, I, every every guy I've ever known who has had a buzz cut at some point goes, no, really, my head's freezing. You know, you get a buzz cut in the winter, and it's like, woo! And even, like, I notice if I put my hair up versus having it down on my neck, it's it's a difference. Your fur does keep you warm, but you don't have a nice big fur coat. This is all you got. So wearing clothes is a first step. We work really hard at staying warm. What's another step we take to stay in our green zone? I'm going to walk over to it. We have elaborate systems, furnaces and wood stoves and coal stoves and fireplaces and we've been doing that kind of thing as long as we've been around. It's an elaborate, that's a lot of work to stay in our green zone. Okay, there will be a brief assignment on classroom by the end of the day, I'm hoping. Um, it should post. You, it's something you'll be able to do in 10 minutes, like Monday morning at school, um, if you can't knock it out tonight. So it should be a very, a very fast little thing, but it'll prep you well for what we're going to talk about on Monday. So actually, maybe it's better if you just do it Monday morning. So if you've got a little bit of downtime, I know a few of you have, I know you have Monday morning. Do you have City Hall every day, third period? Okay. So, um, okay. So it'll be a, a, a quick little thing you can do Monday morning sitting in the cafeteria or whatever. But that's it for today, folks.